All right. Good afternoon. I'm here with my good friend and fellow. I think there's a name for being bald, but our, my fellow bald person, <laughs> Garrett Handsome. Smith. Handsome, that's right. <laughs> Thanks for uh, joining me, Garrett. It's good to be with you. Good to be here. Uh, I want to start and talk a little bit about like why shouldn't investors be just invested in treasuries and in money market funds right now? It seems like that's a pretty reasonable place to be. So why why take risk? when rates are where they are. And, and it has been a, a reasonable place to be. I'd even say it's been, you know, the smart place to be, uh, you know, hindsight, you can throw all your money in a, some AI stock before everybody figured it out. But, uh, you know, if you were to approach it as a sound investor a couple of years ago, um, the traditional quote, traditional investments had come back. I don't buy municipal bonds, you know, treasury laddering out of portfolio, um, having some cash. All that made sense because you could get, you know, five, six, seven percent and not take any risk. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you think about how hard we've worked the last, you know, 10 plus years to get a consistent five or six percent, you had to really work hard. You had to you had to find some exotic, you know, sort of solutions, things other people weren't doing, buying um, municipal bond funds at a deep discount and then trading it when they got tighter or um, in, in the case uh, you know, there is I traffic in um, legacy RMBS was was one of those um, that you know fit a, a, a void where you know you could get some yield when nothing in fixed income was providing yield, mm -hmm. um, and so that you know that that I, I I would I would say that was the right place to be over the last couple of years into these back into the traditional investments, flip your coupon, um, maybe barbell it, um, try to lock in some kind of long term uh, yield at, at these levels, uh, but we're starting to see things change, um, especially as the Fed is, uh, is, is starting to signal they're, they're at least done hiking and, um, and Powell saying, you know, they're getting close to the confidence they need to start cutting. Um, you know, there's, there's a few things at play, but, um, you know, that is, is starting to get people to look again and go, okay, well, where what do I where do I want to be in a year from now when rates are lower? Is there anything I can do now to kind of lock in the opportunity? Mm -hmm. um, and, and and there are some some other opportunities, some other places you can start looking. Yeah, like how you've said it before, it went from these things were exotic and then they weren't exotic because they were widely used and everyone had a multi-sector or non-traditional bond fund. And then rates went down and all of a sudden they're exotic again. So maybe it'd be helpful because, you know, I'm, I'm a novice and I think about this stuff a lot too, from a, a mortgage backed security perspective, like what is that? What's the value chain look like from the perspective of a home buyer, someone who takes out a mortgage to someone who wraps it and sells it to an insurance company or hedge fund or something to a mutual fund? And back again, maybe just introduce what that is and how to invest in it or why we would even want to. Yeah, and and if you know those of us that are old enough to remember uh that during the GFC, um, when there were a lot of home buyers who were underwater and and they called their bank that, that they that they had their mortgage with and say, Hey, you know, I lost my job, but I'm gonna start another one in three months. Can I work something out? And and the banks would say, No, like we don't even we don't even have your mortgage anymore. And I remember this really just befuddled a lot of people. They're like, how, what? how can you not, you know, help, you know, it's better for all of us if I don't just default on my mortgage right now. And so um, there's a little bit of education going on. Uh, basically, when, when uh, and, and, um, a mortgage broker, let's say, or a bank uh, helps you buy a home, um, you give them a down payment, um, they give you cash to buy the house in return. You you hand them a mortgage. Um, you know, basically think of it as a an IOU. Uh, those banks, as they issue a lot of mortgages, start to run out of balance sheet. Um, even even the big ones, you know, they don't have an, enough for this market. The U.S. mortgage market is the largest asset class in the world. So there's there's no you know bank that can that can float that. Uh, so at some point, they need to free up their balance sheet. They'll turn around to investors uh, looking for the money. And um, and the way that works is uh, there's really two channels. If you are a conforming buyer, and think about when you're buying a home, and uh, it sounded like they were trying to fit you into a box, it's because they are. They want a certain FICO score, a certain debt-to-income ratio, certain down payment. Um, you know, uh, 
several uh, indicators. If you give on one, they, you can you might be able to you know give a little more on one and and be lower in another. But but there's certain criteria that if they get, then it meets the GSEs uh, requirements. And that's those the GSEs are Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae and Ginnie Mae. Um, and uh, if they do that, then those agencies will will basically guarantee it. Uh, the bank pays them what's called a G fee, uh, and that's varied over the years. Uh, but you know, it could be a quarter percent, half percent, um, to then guarantee that loan, and then the bank can package up all of these guaranteed mortgages and sell them off, basically like treasuries. They don't have any risk because the government has basically pl placed their stamp on it. Uh, that if they default, they're going to come in and and make the uh, investor whole. Um, so that that's called the agency mortgage pipeline, and it used to be, um, you know, that was the vast majority of of the issuance. Um, you know, a little bit more than a little bit more than half, actually, I should say, a bunch of the vast majority, but 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 the, that's the biggest outlet for the banks. The other half, the bank would either float themselves or. Uh, package out in the non-agency mortgage market. Uh, so these were loans that were conforming for one reason or another. And there's different categories. You know, the first kind of most widely known category would be jum a jumbo mortgage. Um, the GSCs have a limit for your area on what, you know, how much they'll guarantee if you have a $5 million home in an area where the average, uh, you know, home is a million, they're, they're not gonna back that. So, um, so those are jumbo mortgages where it's great, great credit quality, typically very agency like credit, but the home is just too expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's uh, there's credit risk in those because the government's not backing it. And so those are packaged up. You'll have like 2000 to 5000 mortgages um, uh, put in a trust and then that trust issues bonds and you have. Um, the first bonds that get paid are the senior bonds and the mezzanine and the sub bonds. Any losses, let's say one of those homeowners doesn't pay um, and they sell the home and they lose 20 cents on the dollar, the 80 cents that they get pays the senior bond, the 20 cents they lose is written off the bottom. So that subordinate piece, that last piece is the riskiest. It'll also have the highest uh, coupon, the most potential return. Um, and so that this is the non agency market, um, different, uh, reasons for me, the not, not agency market it could be, uh, like we mentioned, home is uh, too expensive. It could also be that they're a business owner. They don't have a W2 kind of income, uh, a little bit more complicated. Um, it could be, a, you know, a, a marginal borrower that, that didn't make the criteria. Um, you know, those are called non QM, non qualifying mortgages. So, um, different categories. Um, and half go out in the non agency uh, side. Uh, sorry, to be long winded. Just kind of one that's transitioned a bit since the, the great financial crisis. Um, the uh, they stopped issuing uh, basically non agency mortgages for for a long time for several years after the crisis, and slowly that's been coming back on over the last you know, call it ten years or so, um, and. Uh, and so um, the old non-agency mortgages were pre-crisis. These are like mm -hmm. 2005 vintage are now called legacy. The underwriting is a little bit different now. Structures are a little bit different. Um, but uh, so we have a new category, I should say new category, a different category today. We have a legacy and then you have new non-agency mortgages. Mm -hmm. So. Big way of saying kind of two broad categories, agency, non-agency, and then there's different subcategories within within each. Gotcha. Super helpful. All right. So now I've got to ask you the million dollar question and bear with me here. So a non-agency or a legacy mortgage is somebody who's been paying off their mortgage for if it's 2005 or older, that's by my calculations, 18 years. So let's assume these were poor borrowers at the time, low credit scores, liar loans, whatever the stuff was when I was still in college. Okay. So let's assume they've paid these for 18 years now. My assumption is their credit scores are really high because they have 18 years of credit history of them paying their mortgage on a consistent basis. I would assume at the same time, the value of their home, although there's some peaks and troughs in there, I'm assuming that the value of their home 
is a little bit higher than it was before. Those all seem like pretty good fundamental aspects of these bonds. Is, am I missing something there? Nope. Uh, about, you know, there's only about 10% of those uh, borrowers who have uh, an LTV greater than 70, loan to value greater than 70. Most are, you know, 20, 30, 40. Um, so wow. we've got equity in their home. Um, and at this point too, they're, they're delevering quickly. You know, when you, when you, you, you make your first mortgage payment and you get that slip, I totally remember, you know, mine, it was like, it was all interest. I'm like, how am I ever going to pay this house off when 90% of it's going to interest? Uh, you know, but, but you're 18 years into your mortgage, you know, now more than half of it, every monthly payment's paying down your mortgage. So, um, you know, investors who are exposed to that, those, those borrowers, um, time is on their side, you know, six months from now, they've already, they paid down another few percent. And so, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, that's certainly. so, so the, the million dollar question is like, fundamentally speaking, and I'm sure there's nuance because these are complex structured products and packaged products. Fundamentally speaking, there's a lot of equity. There's low defaults. There's all these good things in there. How come investing in these have not generated returns? Right? I guess that's the, when I look at it as someone who's not very smart, but who looks at fundamentals, like fundamentals in a bond ought to carry the day, I would think, but it doesn't seem that they are. So what are, give us some understanding a little bit where that dislocation is, or maybe it's short term. It could, in the long term, it could be great, but in the short term, maybe not. Give us some uh, perspective there. Yeah, that's, that's a million dollar question, right? Because the uh, the credit risk is is pretty hard to argue with. Um, you know, there there are some um, you know mortgages that have been delinquent on and off over the years, so they haven't delivered as much. But by and large, the the credit is is super solid, and it hasn't gotten any worse in the last couple of years. So why has mm. the performance in legacy RMBS dropped uh, in the last couple of years? It's, it's not because there's more defaults or the home prices are dropping or, or any of those, um, you know, there's a little bit of a, of an interest component, but by and large, it's fundamentals. I'm sorry. It's technicals. The fundamentals mm -hmm. have been solid. Uh, the, uh, the technicals though, you know, it, it, it kind of goes back to your 1st question. If, if you and I are managing, um, you know, family office and interest rates in the short end, go to 5 and a half, and our bogey has been 6. I mean, we sh we'd be dumb not to pull out of risk and put it into non-risk. At least not a lot, a lot of it, you know. And mm -hmm. and the, the traditional investments really came back on. So so there wasn't a need to jump into an asset class that um, required a lot of mental gymnastics to to understand the bonds. Um, the, you know, the the bid ask spreads tend to be a little bit wider because they're not issuing them anymore. Each one's a science project. You know, why bother when I can just buy a, you know a two year treasury and, and not take any risk? Uh, and so money really flew out of the the more you know exotic uh, asset classes that borrowers relied on post GFC to get their yield. Um, the uh, the interesting thing though is that. You know, two years later, kind of since the sell off and legacy, I, I, I'd call it February a couple of years ago. Um, the, the insurance companies, well, let me, let me back up the, the buyers out there, you know, banks, um, you know, small banks haven't been able to, to buy any assets. Um, so now I'm talking on the investor side. Where's the demand for these bonds? Um, the, the small banks haven't really been able to do much. Um, you know, the large banks can do a little bit. Uh, they're a little bit better collateralized, but um, but they haven't been able to do much either. But the insurance companies have had um, really for the first time in 15 years a, a ton of annuity sales uh, because there's yield now. Uh, and, you know, people who are my age haven't been able to build a laddered bond portfolio in you know, the last 15 years. There's been no yield. We haven't been able to buy any annuities. Um, and so now they are. And so the insurance companies are trying to buy up credit spreads and duration wherever they can, wherever they can get it. And in, in the asset backed and mortgage world, you know, those are first bought in, in the easy, you know, um, um, asset classes that are currently issuing. So what we would call, um, you know, RMBS 2.0 or the non QM that I mentioned, the kind of the new non agency buckets, uh, because 
there's a lot being issued. It's coming to market. You know, the market's predefined. They don't have to do a lot of work. Um, those spreads have come in, at least, you know, in the upper part of the capital structures have, have been cut in half. Um, you know, uh, one particular one I was looking at earlier, it's gone from 230 to, to uh, sorry, 260 to 130 in, in just a few months. Um, and so, um, you know, these now they've I've heard and it's kind of a fun side story from our ABS conference that it's got back from um, agency mortgage uh, CMO mortgages. Those were, if you remember, these really um, complicated, crunched out um, uh, bonds. You know that that were popular in two thousand five, six, and seven, where. You know, they could, they could give you constant prepayments and then you'd have others that were, you know, uh, absorbed all those. Um, the insurance companies now are taking a look at that. Um, and, and most of the people who are making the decisions weren't around in 2005. So the investment banks are having to teach them. Here's how you analyze a, an agency pack um, and, and so forth. Um, they're also starting to look at the legacy space as well, because the credit's pretty solid and, um, and it's got, you know, two to three, you know, maybe more uh, times the the, you know, the credit spread there for them to uh, to capture, and so um, you know this this kind of continues, and I don't see any reason why it wouldn't. Uh, asset, I think you're going to see spreads tighten, you know, across you know all the assets, including places like legacy, uh, and as as rates go lower, as we mentioned earlier, if uh, if if the Fed does continue that that rhetoric and and inflation continues to to trend lower, um, you know, then people are going to be looking for their exotic solutions again. Round and round. Well, let's end okay. on this question. So, I mean, nature doesn't like straight lines or round numbers, but investment markets seem to like them. We're getting pretty close to the ten year at four percent. The you know, the statistical makers, the odds makers out there say the Fed's going to cut in June. Like, we're getting to that below 4%. Is that a sort of trigger, you think, from uh, back to this exotic world to try to make up for lost yield? Or what are your kind of prognostications about when, I don't, I don't want you to forecast something that's impossible to forecast, but I guess I'll just send it there. Is that 4% number of bogey that the markets seem to be looking at? You know, I think it is the 2023, um, you know, my partner, Brian, and I were just looking, it, it, it feels like uh, the 10 year spent most of that time above or around four really spent most of the year much lower. Uh, and, uh, and it's only been about four, really the last third or last quarter of, you know, of last year. And then we dipped down and kind of head baked, you know, came higher. Um, and, and it is, especially in the legacy world, um, it, things change quite a bit. The, the the way that the bonds are structured, they, uh, the the homeowners make their monthly mortgage payment, and that's comprised of principal and interest. Uh, the interest gets paid out to to all the bondholders. Um, the homeowners are paying predominantly a fixed interest rate, so you have pretty much the same amount of interest. It floats a little bit, but essentially the same interest each month to distribute. Uh, the bonds are floaters. So they adjust with the uh, with really the Fed funds rate on the, on the short end, uh, and so as as the Fed raises or lowers rates, the the coupon on these bonds goes up up and down. Um, when rates were lower, it we really kind of looked at it like there wasn't a lot of credit risk, uh, but as rates get you know up you know four or five percent, you know now the coupon on the bonds is higher, potentially higher than the interest that's coming in. It's available to pay. And and so then the bonds kind of get, they get capped. Um, you're not going to get any more interest from them. Uh, uh, some of that interest accrues. And so it kind of pulls up. And then if rates ever go lower, then you get that back. Um, and that kind of magical number, you know, it depends on the bonds. It depends on your portfolio. But, but you know, three and a half to four, 375 to four is, is, uh, you know, makes a big difference in the way these bonds run. Um, not only can you get the full coupon, but, you know, if, as rates go even lower, you can get that old interest that you didn't get back in kind of a lump sum. And um, and then think about when rates are, are this is taking an extreme case, it's zero. Now there's homeowners paying interest, 
and you don't have to pay very much interest to the bondholder. So what happens to that extra interest? It starts to pay down the bonds. Uh, and you know we can we can blow circuit breakers here, but I'll just say in in, in general, um, you know these bonds, many of them have the the ability to write back losses from you know way back in two thousand six, seven, and eight. Uh, and essentially, they'll that means they'll pay us more than more than par, more than a hundred cents of face value. You can get 150, 100, you know, and that currently they're already probably about, you know, at least in our portfolio, about 115 or so. So, um, you know, so lower rates kind of bumps all that up quite a bit. So that is really an inflection point um, for, for legacy. Comes back to exotic to not exotic to exotic. And uh, that's <laughs> a man curve. I like that little ebb and flow. Thoughts. Well, hey, I, I really appreciate your time, Garrick. Thanks for walking through all this for us. It sounds like a crazy interesting time in your market. And these ins insurance companies, you know, they have different mandates than retail investors, but they all kind of go, they all kind of coalesce eventually in the same spot. So we'll be looking forward to seeing how this how this plays out. I still think fundamentals are the name of the game, but I just think in short time horizons, whatever that means. <laughs> You gotta you gotta take the good of the bad. That seems like right, right. Oh. What's that? What's that phrase? Markets can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. <laughs> that's true. That's great, man. Oh, oh, that's very true. I can't remain solvent very long. But thank you, thank you for taking the time. We really appreciate it. We'll come back next time. Let's talk about these uh, loss rate backs. But for now, we'll end it there. Thanks, Garrett, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.